three feet. I can start at the beginning. I remember that time very well. I lived in a small hut together with my little brothers and my mother and a father. My father had no job. And he used to come home every day, totally drunk. I was just a little boy. I did not know what was happening and what was going to happen. He was so cruel to my mother. Uh, she screamed for help, and nobody was coming. That was my life when I was a young boy. I, I woke up, and uh, there was nobody. Everybody had gone. I looked everywhere, but I saw nothing. And I realized that I was completely alone, abandoned, a child without parent. You. You can't imagine it. Me, I was that child. I can remember, I went to my uncle, who was a drunkard, and I was so hungry. And my uncle said, no. And I said, off you go, you go. Then I started walking around the village, begging for food, pleading with people to help me. For about 10 years, I kept on begging. I became a beggar, even sometimes stealing things that were not mine to survive. And I became hard. I became full of hatred. I became a street boy. And then I started asking myself why I was really born, why I was living. I hated my life. And I thought, I don't really deserve to live in this kind of life. And I wanted to take away my life because there was no meaning. But a young man came. He saw me in a desperate situation. He invited me to prayer and a fellowship. And there was a preacher who was speaking about forgiveness of our sin. I thought, why should I trust this man? The preacher prayed. He said, work hard, and by faith, there is nothing impossible before God. This struck in my mind, and they knew hope was planted in my heart.
the next morning, I walked going to the city of Nairobi to get a new life. I had no money, not even a single cent in my pocket. It took me about three and a half days. I never finished school, so I didn't know what kind of a job I would be able to work. I landed to Nairobi, where there are people with money. Those who have power, those who have jobs. But nobody was ready to help me. And then I was just looking at everybody, and they look at me and then say, what are you doing here? You need to go and look for a job. You cannot beg, we can, I cannot give you money. I looked in one area where there are rich people, where they have big houses, and there I was knocking everywhere. And I happened to find a gate somewhere in Nairobi. And again, here I am going to a place where I was not invited. But I'm knocking that door, and I knocked. The lady asked me, why are you disturbing us here? You are knocking the gate. What do you want me to do for you? When she said, come in, I was so happy to hear that. It was really my day. The lady gave me some work to do every day, cleaning the floor of our house, washing dishes, cutting grass outside the field of two acres. There were no machines those days. And they also gave me some food because uh, there was food that remained in the dishes. And that's what I had after I finished work. So life became good and better than ever before. And so after six months, this Indian woman, she spoke to her husband, who was the CEO of a very big farming company. And I was promoted to manager. Dealing with over 800 workers, and I bought a very nice shirt, and I was able to save some money. Then I saw a beautiful young lady, and then I was like, oh, well, uh, something, you know, touched my heart. And uh, you know, I've never talked about it. I was afraid about women. I had no confidence of myself being able to be loved. And now there's a smile. I have a courage to, to talk to this young lady. And that went so well. And after some time, voila, you got me. <laughs> I have eight brothers and sisters. Our first one is called Miriam. Then we have Janie. You know, she's more of the tough one, you know. Then from Janie, we have Grace. Grace is a smart one. And from Grace, we have Dondo. Dondo is more of the mama's baby. From Dondo, we have Kaleli. Kaleli is, um, he's a big brother. Then we have Mweni. Mweni is uh, the one who listens to everybody. She has a listening ear. Then we have my younger brother, Dixon. More of the politician, I'll say. And then we have me, the geek. <laughs> Actually, we are a full football team, I think. I was so happy. I have a family, I have a car, I had a dream. I want to do business, make money and make money. And I came to understand there is a great need of uh, matatu, which is taxes. You 
used to carry us to Eldoret, 40 kilometers away, the first vehicle really on that route. And he used to charge only two shillings and 40 cents, or 50 cents, which is really, today it's a journey of about 300 shillings. And he was very popular, you know, and people used to wait for his Matata Puja 404 pickup. And many people liked him. They liked his vehicle. He had music also in his vehicle. He had some cassettes, CDs. He used to play music for me. And also he used to sing for me. He, he was singing the Jim Leaves. Jim Leaves, Kitten Davis. Dolly Parton, Kenny Rogers, Don Williams. And there's so many rock and roll, you know, so many good music. And then everybody liked to go with the car. You're walking on quicksand, walk slow. Billy, Billy, bio, watch what you say. A pretty girl will get you one of these days. And then everybody, they knew me. Molly Ways. Molly Ways. Molly Ways was my trademark. Molly Ways. You know, he was so proud of me. And he would drive for endless days without sleeping, working hard so he could buy another Matata. And he bought another one and another one. After that, he had a fleet of buses that he was in charge of. And he did not need to drive them anymore. He had people driving for him, making money for him. In 1987, he formed Mooliways Agencies Limited. And then he moved to the next level of business. He was selling tires. He had a welding company. He had a car parts shop. From then, he opened his own insurance company. From the insurance company, he moved to real estate. Mooliways Real Estate. And out of this, the real estate, you remain with about 20%. 30%, and that you put it in your, in your pocket, you really feel good. So with the money I could buy anything, I bought my own Mercedes-Benz from Germany. At that time, that is in the mid-80s, he was a millionaire. And he was among the very few to build a permanent house, a fast stone house uh, in Eldred. I felt great. We had a big living room. I had my own bedroom, and it was awesome. I will be the coolest kid in the hood because we have a TV, right? We have a carpet in the house so we can play, and it's not cold on the floor. And just simple things like that. Having servants in the house, having, you know, drivers and so many cars, and dad will change his car every other. Like, in a year, he would have, like, three, four cars. He would sell them, buy others. Olo used to go for holidays to Mombasa, to Lake Bogoria, to Baringo. And sometimes we'll also go to Two Rivers Dam or the falls for picnics. For me, it was not the actual act of playing games, but the fact that we had time together. We had time just to, to laugh. You know, to laugh at nothing, but the fact that life is good. <laughs> But it was becoming more and more. And uh, the more I did, then the more I also got profit. And there is no end. The more you get, then the more you want to have more. That is the nature of people. We lived a life of riches because we were on top of the class. We had parties and dinners all the time. And we had so many guests, so many visitors that used to come. It was wonderful just to be feeling so influential. That's the class of people we were, and my dad was the great Gatsby of Kenya. And it was really so good. I got connected to some of these people who were also rich, and they owned total oil products. And they were looking for a prominent person to sell and distribute their products. I really realized the value of having money is more than anything else that you can think of, is having the power in your hand. And then my dad had a monopoly in oil and gas. Really, it does not get any better than that. Like, where else do you want to go from there? I traveled to Europe for business, traveling in different parts of the world. Traveled also to New York, when they used to have the twin towers. 
I remember going up almost to the top and then just seeing the city, I really felt like, ah, it was my time. Coming right from the bottom to the highest point to become the supplier of oil, gas, in the whole of Western Kenya. And always, when I remember that, I see the impossible becoming possible. So things were really coming up so well. I had so many workers by then. Business was good. But one day, I got the shock of my life. My dad um, wrote me a letter. And this letter, when I read it, said, my son, it's a long time since I last saw you. And therefore, I would like you to come as my firstborn son, come home. There are things of great importance that you need to come and address here. And so my mind was going around and around, not knowing what to do. I can remember very well when we were very young, our brother, elder brother, uh, Charles, we left him. We were forced to go to look for a piece of land. We left him behind. This was very hard for me. The letter that I got pleaded with me to come and intervene. I thought about it and I shared with my wife. Then I decided to go there. And I found my father was in so much, so much trouble. He owed money to the village, but he could not pay anything. So the people in the village had a big meeting. My father was put down on the ground. Then I was asked by the chief, what do you want us to do? And then I said, do what you want. During that time, these people were furious and they were saying, beat him, punish him. He has done so bad to this woman. But the way my father was crying down there, that made me upset. Then I looked at the chief. I said, please, I said, stop. I said, I'm ready. I am ready to pay what they needed so that my father could be saved. Nanga wanuki. Nanga wanuki. Takeba tiuki. You never name with you. Quiana, Kibi la Kiki, Kibana Mutawas you. Mutua Nikila Nichaqua. Dona was your Nichaqua. Lakini, Nakina, Kibenoa. Joga Jane Wamana, Udo. Wait our Mutua. No, it's in Nambo of Picabu. This way. 
This is how we used to survive on the street. In some instances, we'll use help people to park their car. We'll guide them as they are parking, and in exchange, they have to give us money. I can't count the number of times I've stabbed other boys and women when we want to steal from them and they are resisting. And this is a man who is rich by all standards. I can say he was a millionaire. And because I lived a life full of hatred and anger from my home in the slum, every time I used to hurt somebody for me, it was like a revenge and I used to feel good because people used to hurt me and I had to do so to these people. And when he comes out, his car is gone. So what can he do? He goes and reports it in the police station. My car is stolen. And, and, and that evening, he has to go back. Public transportation, probably in one of his buses. Going by bus, all the thought was about the boys. Why didn't I give these young people money? I am not feeling well. I became sick. I saw faces of me inside them. I saw myself. I was really disturbed. But something was building in my heart. Sasa wakati huo ndio mambo yalizidi sana. Akajisikia ameumia sana moyoni. Siku moja alienda kazini, akaenda akafanya kazi, akashindwa. I was really tormented by these boys in the street. And I could not work anymore. And then I told my secretary. I told her that I was going home. I drove from my office and kept on driving and driving. I did not know where I was going. I found myself far away. And there, I stopped my car and then started crying in the car. I cried, questioning God, why have you done this to me? With all the wealth that I had, why is it that God wanted me to take me back again to the poverty? Four hours in the car, I struggled with the God. And then after four hours, he took me down. I said, yes, God, use me. And the moment I said, yes, God, I got the greatest joy in my heart. I remember him coming home, and then he comes in, and uh, he sits down, and I notice something is different about him. Every evening, we had dinner together as a family. And the night that Dad told us, we were sitting as always. Dad asked us, how was your day? And everybody will say, one by one, we'll say how your day was in school. And then finally, Dad says, I have been thinking and praying about something for so long and I'm wondering, mm hmm so is it another holiday? This is exciting. The words that followed just completely shocked me. I will never, ever do business again. 
I told them, I will never, ever work for money. My face turned on onto mom. My mom looked perplexed. She looked like they had talked about it, but they had not really talked about it. He went on to elaborate that God had actually shown him that he needed to sell everything and start helping the poor in the society, the children who are abandoned, the street children. And I was there like, I, I, was, I could not fathom. No more income coming in. It was too much for me. You know how you feel as though the world has sort of collapsed uh, beneath your, your, your feet? That is how it felt at that time. After that, dinner was finished quite quickly. <laughs> Lakini nilifunjika moyo. Nikafunjika moyo. Nikainamia chini. Na si kuongea. Kulala kesho yake nilimuuliza haya yote umefanya katika maisha kwa sababu hii inachukua maisha yako yote. Unaona ni mambo ambayo ni jambo ambalo linafaa katika maisha yako na maisha ya familia yako na akaniambia ndio niliamua kwa sababu sio mimi mimi najua Mungu ndiye aliniita na Mungu ndiye anataka nimfanyie hiyo kazi on a plain language as called total madness that's what it is In the street, you're not sure whether you're going to wake up the next morning. To come to the street in the middle of the night, it was really, really dangerous for him and for his life. By then, we had already smoked marijuana, I had taken some heroin, and we were carrying knives, and we were sniffing gasoline. So any slight mistake, then that could have been the end of his life. What my mom went through, I, I don't think any mom should go through that. You marry into a secure family, whereby you know your kids will be provided for until your husband goes and decides to sell everything, you know. How, how, how do you let go of what you, you hold dearly? And how do you decide when, when to share your love? That must have been hard for her to do that. Somewhere in the back of her head, she must have gone, what am I gonna do when the money runs out? But she did it anyways. Mom had to cook for the children and she had to, she was the nurse and taking care of everything that you can think of. 
everything. I was the one who was taking care for the children. I would wash their clothes and cook for them, give them the medicine when they were sick. It is very hard work, but I didn't get tired because I loved the family. Yeah, and I loved my husband. Yeah. Initially, we had three children, four children, and the number kept on growing, and now our family was suddenly bigger. From nowhere. I went to the street. Then I brought them every day. There was no one day that we said, it is enough. I never said there was no space for a child who was suffering. As the days progress, I was praying in my heart that this will not be true, that dad was just joking and he would continue working. I, I thought he will not shut everything down. People give donations. Why can't you do that? Why can't you just sponsor a kid? That would be awesome. You can work, sponsor a kid, perfect. We still live our life, everyone's comfortable. But he actually stopped all the businesses. He started selling stuff. He started closing shop and people called him crazy. He brings his Mercedes Benz with loaves of bread in it. And there he meets his little children in the streets. That was a real uh, scene to see. People really started talking around town and saying there must be something wrong. Because we returned with him in the streets. Less than five minutes, he's mobbed by, by those kids. And there are no businesses you could be doing them unless you're selling drugs. So people are very skeptical about him. Even others as close as me could not understand, do you close a business in order to serve street kids? Do you, can't you do that too? That seems a little bit strange. He didn't tell us that he was bringing the children in our house to share with us. I think that was really, really rude of him. They smelled so bad. They had lies on them, tattered clothes and no shoes. They broke the toilet. How that happened, I do not know. I don't know whether I think they were just stepping on the toilet and they broke it. I despised them because mom suddenly was taking time to go and bath them. They were given one of the rooms in our house. There was no time for much after that in terms of the family, the nuclear family. There was no privacy anymore. I couldn't understand why, 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 and I kept blaming those children again. And theirs was just to laugh and just have fun in our house. <laughs> Time it was, Mom, this is happening, Mom, this is happening, Mom. And they were playing with stones and playing with all sorts of things and breaking our windows. They were swinging on curtains, they were climbing on walls. That was unheard of before they came. The house was meticulously clean every day. It was really rough. And the children became now a hundred suddenly, and we had to share some of the rooms with them. Because the kids were so many, I went to the street, brought more. He brought more children and more children and more children. And now he had to extend the house so that they had enough space for the children. The children in the evening at the classes we can help the Bureau of making concrete on the stones. We love to teach them how to do some work, money work, and able to understand the real importance of working. 
The compound was small. The garden had to be thrown out. Our playground had to be removed. Our swings had to be removed. The lawn had to be removed. And my dad put these wooden structures that are pretty much ugly to me. And everything had to be cemented just so that he will set up a school for the kids. And I remember I had a favorite dress. It was yellow in color. And I needed to give out my favorite dress, <laughs> Among, along with other things, clothes and shoes and toys and... It wasn't really working well, you know? It was like us against the kids. They were rough, they would fight between themselves, they want to fight with us. It was not good. I don't remember one day that my own children were happy at all. And it got to a point that we could not settle in very well with the kids and we had to go to boarding school. They had no choice. I took five of them my own biological children to boarding school so that we could have enough time to care and to love these children. We had to do that, to sacrifice. Grade one, grade two, grade three, I was in boarding school. I remember the whole time my dad came once uh, for a board meeting. And my parents came to visit me um, with my siblings. And she had on my yellow dress. <laughs> I felt like he had kicked us out. He had abandoned us so he could spend time with these other kids who did not even belong to him. I felt angry. I really felt angry because I was wondering, who are these children anyway? Um, why can't their parents give them the things that um, they're taking from me? My mother was a prostitute. And at that time, I was seven years. And my mother could come home drunk, and she could bring some men in the house, maybe two men, one for her, and she could bring one for me. And when I refused, she could start beating me. Babango, akakuja kanirep, nikwa mdogo. They told me that your mother was a prostitute, so she died because of AIDS. And they told me that's why we think that you have the same, same disease. They brought me to Eldred, where the other kids were. They welcomed me. They did not care if I, I was doing prostitution. They decided to take me in. I was amazed to see all the kids. There were so many kids calling dad, their dad. So I was wondering which kind of the family is this. First time I met Charles, one of the first things that stood out uh, was just his smile. He was just welcoming. And he would look at you straight in the eye and he say, 
Hoi. It's a sign of peace. And you see that he's come to bring good. And then he took us to his home. He came and welcomed me, he smiled, big smile. It was so broad, it was so warm. And you see that he was a father looking down. And he said, welcome, this is your family now. These are all your brothers and sisters. It was a moment that I cannot explain. I've never lived in a nice house, given nice food. I've never met my biological dad, and here is a man saying that he was going to take care of us. So around that time, Charles started bringing the street kids and the prostitutes into the church. The elders didn't like it. The street children were considered as bad people. You can't bring them to a holy place. I was a young boy in the Sunday school classes. I, I still remember to this day how sad that looked. And one of the elders asked them to go out because those are bad people and we are good people. One night, the church elders had a long meeting, and a plot was hatched. They decided to chase him away. I was given all kinds of names, but I made the covenant, and I knew whom I was serving. I said, I would even rather die than to stop. So they literally kicked him out. He didn't have a choice. It was unimaginable that they will say, you choose the children or choose to be in the church. Mom's friends were telling her that she needs to leave dad. She needs to divorce dad because how is this possible? She said, they told her that dad must be crazy, they sh that she should take him to hospital for a checkup. Nili konda sana wakati ule kwa sababu ya mafikira, nikuwa nafikiria mbona watu awa and they would ask her, you know, how can she take this? Why can she leave this crazy man? And my mom, I'm sure, as a woman, probably she thought about it. Okay. Well, you take it. You like it to drink. You love it. But mom stood by him and she supported him unconditionally. And not because she had to, but because she chose to. I think losing those friends brought us closer as a family because then we needed to rely on each other. We were each other's friends. We had we were all we had. And the children became more, and the finances became minimal. It was going down in the bank, down and down every year, every year. Me and my younger brother had to come and study with the rest of the kids, and it didn't make much sense. My wife came one evening and said, my dear, our stores are running out of food. And then I said, why are you asking me about where we are going to get food? Don't you remember that I said, you ask God, pray. <laughs> It was no point of return. I thought, what are we going to do now? And from nowhere, we heard the bell in the gate ringing, and someone went to check, and there was a lady we did not know. And she came with a truck full of food. Uh, 
I was speechless. But this lady said, here, yeah, this is for you. A donation for the first time. Akatulete chakula, akatulete pesa, alikuwa na shilingi alufutano kwa baasha. Na hiyo chakula ikatubeba kwa munda mrefu sana. And even for us that were watching him and listening to him, we were all amazed. But we watched, and with the passing of the day, these children became more and more responsive, more and more obedient, more like family. They respected him, each of them calling him dad, calling Mrs. Muli mom, and we saw a very significant change in their lives. And he began to train those kids to be responsible. For example, teaching metal work and woodwork, tailoring both adult and little children's clothes, then even gardening to bring up some vegetables right on the compound. That's why I think now I can say, Muli children, not just home, but family. And in family, you teach everything. It got to a point where there was no more room for more kids in the compound. Everyone was brushing shoulders with each other. Sasa wakati ule tukafikiria, ni wapi tunaweza lete watoto, ama ni wapi tunaweza jengea watoto. Tukakumbuka tuko na mali yetu hapa ndalani, tuje hapa katura seka, nyumba ya retirement. And uh, so kids got in a bus, and boom, the move started. Muli children's family. We started our journey, we drove all the way, via Nairobi, Vika, and then to Dalani. And this is moving from a very big house on Eldoret to a place that is made of earth and soil and iron sheet roofing, and there's no nothing. There was no water, there was no electricity. We used to use kerosene lamps back then. Yes. But to makeshift buildings were put in place, the children came in, and we started living there. At that time, 1995, the place was very hot. It was 105, 110 at times in a year, and uh, it was very difficult to walk the land. But we will say that this place will be full of fruits. It will be full of vegetables. And I would ask, what? It's so dry. You tell us about these things, and sometimes we don't understand it, and sometimes we think he's crazy, because he was dreaming about us having a, a dormitory well built with stones. And I, at that time, we were staying in a tin shed. And I, I felt really a lot of pressure. You, you have all these children that you want to eat. Others are um, crying, and uh, others, they need to be taken to hospital. In some of the cases, HIV. And uh, they started complaining. They said, no, Dad, we don't want to stay here. There are no people here. It, it, it's, we are in the desert, you know, and uh, they wanted to run away. So some children left Dalani to go sniff glue in the streets. Cocaine, heroin, glue, alcohol, bang, name it. You know, the kid's the kid forever in the world. And when we see the children going back to the street, we are not happy because we know we lose them and they are going back and maybe they are going to die there because in the street there's no love. They, there's no people who love them. I always go back along the street, in the slum, everywhere, looking for them. And then when I find them, they always say, we cannot believe it. This must be a dream. I tell them, please, this is your home.
We built that place by hand, step by step, brick by brick. We built every building, every foundation that was laid there. I learned about construction with the rest of the children. I learned how to put uh, brick on mortar, how to make the ratios of, of cement, sand, and ballast, and all that. And right now, I have so many skills that I learned as I grew up that even now I can use them in my day-to-day -day life. And we continue to do that, training the boys how to build not only building houses, but bridge. The bridge back here, we have started over the last two weeks now. And in order to beat the time, we do not know exactly when uh, the, the rain will come. We do not know. But uh, even though it's quite unfortunate that the whole area is affected by the sphere drought, we are taking this advantage of building such a bridge so that even when it rains, then it's just like Noah, Huck. You build, and people ask you, why are you building this one? But the reality is that one day, the rain will come. During the drought, we did not have any water that we could boil from the river. So he had to drive four hours every day to Nairobi to get water so that the kids here could have water to drink. It was a really hard time for this country as a whole. Hello. They took water four days ago. That's when they had water last. Those people, we are really dying by uh, drinking bad water that they were trying to dig along the riverside when there was no water flowing and they were dying. Tulikuwa tunachota maji ya mtoni, tunachemusha watoto wanakunywa. Wakati tulikuwa hapa tulianza watoto walianza kugonjeka typhoid. I remember a young boy, his name was Oscar Kiberenge. Um, he got sick, it was because of the water. Tulienda kuangalia mtoto mmoja, na wakati tulifika tu, hakasema, Daddy, Daddy. Tukaomba mungu muokoa maisha yake. He was very low during that time. He was trying to figure out, God, you, you cannot give me these kids here for them to die in my hands. I remember dad and mom praying about it, and dad crying, praying, saying he was begging for water. And then one night, he woke up. He woke mom up, and they went outside. And they walked from the house where they were staying. And he felt a voice telling him to walk up straight, turn, and that's the place where water will come. They prayed and they felt that this is the place where they needed to dig. He believed there is water there. And they prayed and the work started the next day. It was hard to believe him, very hard. 
Most of the workers did not believe it, so they did not want to start digging. They refused, actually, to be part of it. And as the kids, we came and we started digging, when we started digging. My brother, Dixon, and Isaac, they dug for the water. Now, this is after trying to dig a couple of boreholes with machines going a couple of hundred feet down to get water, and we do not have any water. And this guy goes like, you know, we need to grab a couple of mattocks and start digging. That is total craziness. Most of us not believing. We started digging for a couple of days, and we dug, we dug, and we got to this hard rock. It's a volcanic rock. And, you know, we called my dad, and we told him, we've dug your vision, and this is where it's taken us. We have a rock, and there's no water, so, you know, what should we do? My dad says, I was shown water here, and just keep on digging. So during that time, it was the time for my younger brother's class to go and dig. So he got in there and he was digging. And he takes this mattock and just hits on the rock. And all of a sudden, the water got out. I remember my brother yelling like, hey, dad, mom, you know, we, we got water. And my dad's like, what? And there was water that just came out pouring from, from the ground. And there was a lot of commotion and everything because it was, it was unheard of. And, you know, they started shouting. <laughs> They're shouting, Maji. Maji, Maji means water. They were shouting, water, water, because it was actually coming. When I finally got to understand that, why he was doing it, I regained trust in my dad. And from then, I started supporting him. And after that, we had water in Delani, in an area where it is not known to have any well. There are no wells in this area. It's, it's unheard of. But we do have water. And the children stopped getting as sick as they were getting sick. So that's, that was a miracle. water purification system it was set up and from that there was a water tower that was was constructed and this was able to supply water uh, not only to the children but also we got water also for the use in the farm and uh, that's where it began and over a period of time the number of children grew all the way to more than a couple of hundreds to to a thousand and the the, the need to feed the children was very high. And dad was thinking on how to be self-sustaining. And, and that's where the, the farming part really took a different uh, turn. The idea of us being able to be self-reliant was a very paramount uh, aspect of how uh, my father was viewing the entire project. You know, people in Africa, in Kenya, they all, even the government, they depend on donation from the Western world. And then I always feel like, what can we do as Africans to change that attitude? My father noticed that and started to think through how he could do something differently to be able to complement the donations that we were having. Because I used to beg, you know, <laughs> a beggar has got no choice. I, that's something I hated. And for that reason, I said I will never beg. And then I kept on thinking, how can we build a project that would be self-sustaining? As we began, we said, with the one hectare outdoor with oxen, now to 500 acres using a tractor. And right now, as we're seated here, we're looking at crops that are growing so well production is so many times the conventional outdoor production. We're able to sell excess that we produce from here 
in the European market so that we can have some income to sustain Muli children's family. Then in 2003, we got to design a hydroponic system, which is a greenhouse covering about 600,000 square feet. So the water will collect as rainwater on top of the greenhouses and it's conveyed through a piping system into reservoirs. That water will be used to uh, carry out fish farming. This is a new venture. We are trying to put up some fishes here on my right, it's 2,000, a small dam here. This is something that we want to do, train people how to fish, and train people how to eat and getting the fishes. So that's what I mean. Yeah, so, so you see, little finger is as little grown to big fish like this. After harvesting water from top of our greenhouses, which is almost a billion liters, then we use that water to irrigate the trees. And we are gathered here with one purpose, to plant trees in order to change our, our climate. We can do something with our own hands, and we don't have to wait for the government to tell us what to do, because this is our Kenya, this is our future. To plant trees so that we can attract water to these places. You can see it's very dry. Uh, we hope to come here over and over again until we turn this yard into a forest. Since 2004, we've planted over 1.5 billion trees in this property alone. The water goes up and forms the clouds, and from forming the clouds, we have rainfall. With trees being planted annually, we have been able to create a microclimate and therefore we have more regular rainfall. This is real. When I bought this piece of land, there was nothing. There was no trees, there was nothing, no water. And through planting trees and through water conservation, I've seen that really working. One big dream that I have is to transfer the knowledge to the young generation so that we change Africa, we change our country, Kenya. warfare at its most basic and most brutal. A man being murdered because he belongs to a different tribe. I remember we were sitting watching TV and, and Kenya was burning. And we were sitting there, and I remember my dad called us, and he said, we can't let this happen. We have to do something. The government, they were overwhelmed completely. And the children did not have food. Dad had said, if we don't step in, children are going to die. By then, there were internally displaced persons camps that had been set up by the government, the biggest being in Eldoret. So when dad said that, um, it was automatic for us that, okay, work, let's go and work. I remember very well that day in the bus. Buses had been burnt on the side of the road. There were dead bodies everywhere. We were also scared. What if we get killed ourselves? The authorities there did not want dad to actually come in because they felt that they had control. But dad, he said, even if you refuse me to bring food, I'll still bring food. That is how we started. And the children would come out of their tents and follow the bus because 
They knew MCF brought them food. For a whole year, the year 2008, we gave out food to these children. Over 2,400 children every single day. We ended up um, working with the Red Cross. And we, we got some of the children from the IDP camps, and some of them came to MCF, where they now have family. We are one family. We are one Kenya, Regardless of their tribe that they come from, we protect them. In Africa, we can only move forward only when we trust each other. Girls and boys, shall we clap for your own brothers, your own sisters? Shall we clap for them? And all of them? MCF never stops growing. Every time you have, um, you know, disasters happening. We have post-selection violence. Parents end up dying. They leave kids, you know, without any parents. We take them. I think that's part of what the world is today. And I don't think there's one day we'll say enough is enough. It's not the kind of business or where you go like, we want to do this for one year and we're done. This is a lifetime thing. Dad, we thank God for you coming in this world. May your new age open your opportunities not only to us, but to the world at large. We love you, Dad, and we always cherish what you have made us to be. We are, we are, we are what we are because of you. After high school, Dr. Charles Muli took me to university. After graduating, I went back and did master in psychology. And now I'm working with an NGO based in Atlanta, Georgia, and Marietta. And I realize Dr. Charles Muli dream and prophecy is coming to pass. Currently, we uh, are the defending champions of East, Central, and Southern Africa. And we'll be representing uh, Kenya in the Olympics for martial arts by the end of this year. Out of 935 schools, Moli Children's family was number one on national examination. They're becoming doctors, they're becoming teachers, they're becoming managers, they're bankers. It's, it's amazing. Not counting the 84 who are currently in the Kenyan universities and colleges. To Daddy Moli, I appreciate you so much. I'm now in Kabarak University, pursuing a bachelor degree in commerce. They have paid for my school fees. I'm so grateful for them because now I'm taking a Bachelor of Commerce and I hope when I finish, I'll go back to my place and help my people and my community. One day, uh, the Lord may take me home, in eternal home, then they could be able to manage this place. But um, I don't have one particular person, not even my own son or my own daughters, because this is not my doing, this is not my property, this is not my, my work. He chose me, like he did to Moses, to be able to do this work faithfully. And that's why over the years now, I'm no longer worried. I cannot tell the world who are those people who really take over. 
when I am not alive. Twenty-five years from now, I know MCF will be a place where the people, they will come from all over the world to see what is going on. And uh, I know the kids, those who went through in our, in our program, I know there will be big people in the, in the society and also in the Kenya, also in Africa, and maybe in the world. I know there's no limit in MCF. For you to be here, for you to be alive today, it's a miracle. For you to be the way you are, it is God's miracle. Let me tell you, I worked 25 years, and I work because I know everything is possible, I'm telling you. Let's remain focused in our studies and in everything that we do. Let us remain focused. Let us work hard so that we change the world. At night, my dad ties his shoes up, puts on a cord, gets in a car, and he drives and drives, not somewhere specific, but looks until he sees an orphan sleeping alone in the street. And the first thing he says, Oi. Oi. Oi.
Yeah.